Huh, that's strange. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. I've got a handful of heavily played guitars to share with you guys tonight, and we're going to start with one that the Guitar Rescue listed on Reverb. This is what is known as a Les Paul signature. Now, one glance at this, you might think, huh? This actually had Les Paul's name associated with it? Yes, this was part of the Low Impedance series, you know, Les's favorite models. From the personal, professional, and recording, there was this Les Paul signature thrown in there. And we actually have documented a few of these on the show if you're interested in learning more. But they're great guitars. I love these things for clean. Essentially what they've done is it's half 335 and then this half is slightly less Paul-like in shape. So maybe it's more apropos to call it 75% 335 and then this little square over here is less Paul. And I suppose we could give the less Paul credit for having the toggle switch up here on the horn. But the pickups they used in this series were a little bit different from the other low impedance ones. But they offered some really fancy electronics, including in and out of phase and then a knob down here that further controls your sounds with a master volume and master tone. Now these might look like knobs, but they're actually selector switches. So brief history lesson aside, we went from this to this. So naturally, I saved this in my watch list because we've got mini humbuckers in here. It's not all that uncommon for somebody to wrap those things out for humbuckers, but this was the first one I saw with mini buckers. And then I saw, oh, Nashville style bridge with the stop bar tailpiece. Typically, you'll find the harmonica bridges on these, but you'll see that the placement is very different looking and it's a little bit more slanted than normal. But now we go over to our controls, a single master volume and a three way toggle switch. What happened to our one up here? Look at that, they even took the time to bind the F holes at the same time. That was enough for me to say, yeah, we're going to make an episode on this. But it wasn't until a viewer of the show sent me this listing on my Facebook page and said, look at that neck. I scrolled through the rest of the photos and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that just got even more interesting. It appears we've got some sort of an L5 neck. I'm not necessarily an expert on these, but that almost looks like the 40s-ish logo style. But then up here, it looks very 80s. Then we've got the Epiphone Sheraton-like inlays. We've got binding over here, but then a couple of additional binding stripes within the fretboard itself. This thing's pretty fancy. And it's heavily worn. We've got finish checking everywhere. We've got an arm resting area that's been worn through to the top maple. What is the story on this? Is it some sort of a weird prototype? Well, with a price tag of 2400 I highly doubt it. According to the seller, this thing was refinished at one point in time, and when they did the refinishing, that's when they covered over the existing holes, they moved your bridge and tailpiece, and they converted it into the way you see it today. However, they might have had to have moved it like that because maybe the scale length of the neck was different from the original 24 3 quarter scale length. It really wouldn't surprise me if this was just like a factory second runoff body that was never actually finished, so somebody got it and played Dr. Frankenstein and put things together. As you'll notice, the finish checking isn't what you normally see on a Gibson, so who knows what kind of finish styling that they actually used. But then when we get to the back, we see some other very strange things. One of the biggest things about the Les Paul Signature is they are a pain in the butt to work on. If anything goes wrong, you have to fish it through the F holes. And since it has some kind of complicated electronics, it makes it a little bit more tricky than just a regular 335. So somebody took the easy route back here and just put a toggle switch plate back there. It almost looks like they might have had something right here at one point in time, and then that got covered over during the refinish. But look at our neck. Oh boy, is what I said the first time I saw it. It almost looks like a truss rod channel, and then you insert your key in there to adjust the neck. I'm curious, did they just sink another screw sideways so it secures into the neck like that? Because you've got a couple of other fasteners down here, so they kind of converted it into a bolt-on neck, I think. And just look how deep this finish checking is. That's not checking. That's just the finish like cracking, almost coming apart. That's just all over. We've got a moved strap button. We've got really fancy binding along the edges. It's been a few years since I've had one of these, but I do not remember that. So they probably custom bound this. Now the back of our headstock, that looks very 80s. So it lines up with the logo. You've got your volute too. Wouldn't it surprise me if that's a maple neck. So in the collectible guitar world, this is a bit of a dog, but as a player, this looks incredibly fun. And hey, if mini humbuckers aren't your thing, modify it further, who cares? Put humbuckers in there, P90s. 2400 bucks. I really think it's worth it. Reverb's price guide charts them around 35 to 65. The only thing scaring me away from clicking buy it right now, I don't fully understand what's going on with our neck here and the seller doesn't mention it at all. And at 96 watchers within four days, I'm sure it'll end up selling. But anyways, now it's time to talk about our thumbnail. This has aged beautifully. It's ultra ambered over. It's a custom L5. We've got the more modern style flower pot chalice. 
So this is one of those L5 asses. We've talked about it a lot. It was Gibson's attempt to take the high-end L5 arch tops and create a solid body version of it. So no, it's not a flattened pancake Les Paul, but it's fun to call him that. But this is one that was rode hard and put away wet. This started life as a really dark tobacco sunburst finish, but all the yellowing just made it even darker. But somebody's hand has rubbed through the finish right here. We've got replacement knobs on it. I would say this guitar has reached stage four. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's four stages in a guitar's life. There's mint condition when it's the most desirable to collectors. Then there's stage two where, yeah, it's been played. It's got a few nicks and dings, but nothing too, too crazy. But then there's stage three when there's like one or more obvious flaws or cosmetic deficiencies. And that's when a guitar is worth the least but then once you start to accumulate so much wear and tear if it looks good sometimes you get to what i call stage four where people will actually end up paying just as much as a mint condition guitar because it's really cool in the way that it's aged that's the same concept behind why people buy relic guitars they're trying to capture a stage four instrument because they're not always for sale and not every beat road dog actually makes it to stage four again it's a bit subjective but i would say this one has a very close vibe Mainly because of the headstock. I just love the dark ambering when it's natural and it's got the nicks and dings. But check out our back. They just somehow wore through the finish back here. But the neck is beautiful on that one with lots of figuring. You can tell it's been worn a bit, but it was well respected there. Then our serial number takes this one to Kalamazoo, 1979, 82nd day of the year. I'm surprised it still has the original Clues and Seal Fast tuners on it. That's a fun one, but how much do they want? Because these are typically somewhere in the five to $10,000 range, depending on pieces and tops. Which speaking of, I, I can't really tell if this is a two piece top or not, it's so dark. But these guys are asking 9,500, but they are open to offers. But now we've got a couple other interesting Les Pauls I'd like to share. So this one was listed by Doms up in North Canton, Ohio at 2000 bucks as a triple humbucker guitar. So when I first clicked on this, I just thought, okay, somebody took a 90s Les Paul studio and routed it for a middle humbucker. Kind of what it looks like here because we don't have any binding. That's how I knew it was a studio. Regular Nashville style bridge. However, it looks like the slightly more modern ones with the hex key adjustments. Somebody's put a Les Paul custom style pick guard on it. So that's not factory original. So that tells us the middle pickup was likely added. It almost looks like that's chrome, whereas these are nickel too, so that's another slight giveaway. The fretboard from this angle anyways looks like ebony, but what really threw me for a loop here is, whoa, that's not what you normally see on a studio. It's the Gibson crown inlay, which you typically see on SGs, but there are various other models. Unfortunately, I can't read the most important digit over here, but it was birthed sometime in the 2020s. It's possible it was a factory employee guitar, like it was one of their anniversary ones, so they were allowed to spec it whatever way they want. That's typically the only way Gibson USA does something special outside of dealer long-standing custom runs. Their other option is it's a parts guitar somebody pieced together. Or is Gibson bringing back the Ebony Board Studios? That would be awesome. I would love for Gibson to do that. Because at that point, I could still suggest people paying 1600 bucks brand new for a studio. I honestly could not tell you what this thing is. But let's see what our seller says here. A seemingly rare Les Paul with three humbuckers and a crown inlay. Yeah, he's saying it's got burst buckers in the neck and bridge and a 490T in the middle. It's got a gig bag, so yeah, unfortunately. More questions than answers on that one, but it's already sold, so you don't have to worry. Next up tonight, being offered by Southside Guitars, we have a 76 Les Paul Standard. 1976, it's a pretty cool year. It's one of the first years where the Les Paul Standard branding came back. And it's right about the time when they switch into the three-piece maple necks. Most times you'll still have a pancake body, but the reason we're featuring this one is some artwork. Look at that. You've got like some sort of a interesting desert scene airbrushed onto it. Somebody added a TP6 tailpiece. They swapped out our knobs. But then we've also got a little mini toggle over here for who knows what. Looks like they played with our pickups a little bit too. That really just makes it players great, but I thought this airbrush artwork over top of the dark red sky with the wood grain underneath, it's very ominous. I like it. It's like being in the desert at the sunset. Their price, 4850 But who knows, it might speak to someone. And along similar lines, here's a 1978 Les Paul standard. The seller described it as Frank Zappa meets Ace Fraley. Let's see what he's talking about, because usually Deluxe is Townsend. They took a Cherry Sunburst standard, they routed it out for three humbuckers. So that's how we're getting ace vibes here, three uncovered DiMarzios. That actually looks surprisingly good. They put a harmonica bridge on it, TP6 tailpiece, and you've got your regular rosewood fretboard, although it is very dark, so it looks nice, and you've got your trapezoid inlay. 
Oh, well, cool. They even went for the cream backplates. Again, a la Ace. And then we've got a strap lock in kind of a strange location. I think the Townsend signatures actually have those. This whole thing just looks like a custom to me, but holy cow, count them. One, two, three, four, five mini toggle switches. Maybe that's where they're getting Zappa vibes from. Sweet, we've got a wiring diagram. So switch number one, this is middle pickup, either humbucking or single coil mode. So it is a coil splitting switch. Switch number two, it's for the bridge humbucker, doing the exact same thing. And switch three, controls the middle pickup so it can be used in combination with the neck or bridge pickup. So that one actually has three different settings on it. So if you're in the off position, it's just not on. And all right, switch four is with our phase control. So when you're in the middle position between the two normal pickups, you can get your quacky Peter Green stuff. And switch five turns the bridge pickup on and off. Okay, so they wanted to be able to use the middle pickup in these specific situations. That's a long ways away from Fraley's only the bridge pickup is wired up. <laughs> And we'll end tonight's episode with a beautiful 59 reissue. I just saw this one pop up one night and thought the top was extra unique. It was very bubbly. And I was surprised it sat on reverb for more than a night. But it did sell within two or three days. And then if you're still looking for it, it did get posted back to reverb. Somebody was flipping it for a little bit more money. And unfortunately, it didn't look as good in the new seller's photo as it did in this one. So I think you really got to take this one out to the sunlight or maybe appreciate it in person. I just love how the grain became so dark in this lighting. This seller did a fantastic job photographing this. It's got finish checking, grain, colors, nicks and dings, wear and tear, all the fun things that tie into our theme of this episode. All right, Chocolateites, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.